Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the day you've given us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the kingdom that he uh, came to this earth and taught about and, and died for. Thank you for this congregation that meets here at Farmington. We uh, are so grateful uh, to you and we come together this morning, uh, our spiritual sacrifice of worship to honor you, to declare our love for you. It's our prayer that the uh, things we say and do this morning are edifying for us, but wholly acceptable in your sight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Man shall not live by bread alone. Uh, you might recognize that from Deuteronomy 8.3, and you might kind of wonder where we're going with this. Um, so years prior, the Israelites had been enduring this long, hot, dry journey from Egypt to Mount Sinai, and they began to run out of food. The days passed, and their hunger grew more and more intense, and they wondered, does God even notice? And they thought that they might die of such an intense hunger. Despite their lack of faith, God takes care of his people, and he ended up raining bread down from heaven, this miraculous food they called manna. 
No longer would they have to worry about what they would eat. Many years later, when the promised land was within sight and their years of wandering had come to an end, Moses reminded the Israelites of what God had done for them during the last 40 years. The provision of manna, he said, was intended to teach them a lesson about the nature of God. He says, He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna to teach you that the Lord does not, that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So God became the direct source of his people's physical nourishment to lead them to understand he would also be the direct source of their spiritual nourishment. They were tempted to believe the same thing that we are tempted to believe, that life can be sustained by bread alone, because when you eat, you don't starve, you're full, you're somewhat satisfied, at least to a degree. But through the centuries, man he has been hungering for something different. He has had a spiritual hungry, a hunger that has echoed through the centuries for a type of certain heavenly bread that we read about in the New Testament. Well, fast forward years later, and it's no longer the Israelites in the wilderness, but we find Jesus, and he's been fasting for a long time, for 40 days, and he's hungry. And Satan tempts him to turn the stones to bread. And Jesus, he turns for strength not in food, but in the words of Moses, in the words of God, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, he quotes. And while there may have been no bread in Jesus' stomach, his spirit was full and he was satisfied. He had spent 40 intimate days with his father praying and meditating and seeking him. Jesus was full. He was full on God, the nourishment that he truly needed. And in his teachings, Jesus reflected this idea that God's kingdom would be this realm in which his provision would cause man's fundamental hungers to cease. And at the heart of this great provision would be Jesus himself. Jesus, this true bread from heaven that gives life to the world from John. Jesus, this bread of life. So the night before his death, Jesus decided uh, he described to his disciples this type of ceremony by which they should remember him. See, there's many ways he could have offered us to remember him, but his memorial service would consist of eating bread and drinking the fruit of the vine. And then the, the famed passage that, that most of you are familiar with, Luke 22, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So from a purely physical perspective, this act of remembrance is fairly unfulfilling. Uh, a small piece of bread, uh, a sip of grape juice, it's not going to leave you feeling very satisfied. But spiritually and symbolically, this is a royal banquet because it is about Christ, our source of true bread and nourishment, the heavenly bread that we've waited for for centuries. By doing this, we are proclaiming that there is something deeper, something more fulfilling in life than just food and drink. And we, like our forefathers, are learning that man does not live on bread alone, but we are filled by his word and by Jesus, our bread of life. So let's remember him now as we pray. Dear Lord, we are so, so grateful you have always remembered your people from being with the Israelites in the wilderness and feeding them with the manna to the days of Christ, the bread of life, our sustainer of our faith. Uh, we thank you for remembering us as we now remember your son. We thank you that Christ came in the form of man. He gave his body. And we honor and remember that sacrifice now as we partake of this bread. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Dear Lord, you are so, so good to us. Um, Christ's broken body, his shed blood, 
It's such a precious thing, blood that was uh, poured out and washes away our sins still today. Powerful blood that fills us up spiritually. Thank you for loving us to the point of Jesus going to that cross. We love you and we're grateful to have this time to remember you together. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. And as Jesus sacrificed, we too are to be a giving people who give freely of ourselves just as he gave. Uh, it is an expression of our faith, something that we, we do uh, with cheer. And so at this time, we'll pause to remember our blessings and uh, all that we've been given and, and just take a couple minutes to give back. Uh, we won't pass the basket, but as usual, if you want to give online or uh, the black box in the back, um, that's welcomed. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, you are a great God. You meet our needs. And uh, just as you've taken care of your people over the centuries, you've been with us over these years that we've been here on earth, and we thank you. And we pray we'd always be a giving people, uh, just like you are a great giving God. We thank you, Lord, and it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. When Jesus walked along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, he saw some fishermen. And as he saw some fishermen, he called out to them, Come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And as Peter, Andrew, James, and John heard that call and responded, they dropped their nets, left everything behind, and followed Jesus. And, and as a result of that action, their lives, and, and really the whole world and everyone's lives, would never be the same. That was a powerful call. And it's something that we have to respond to as well. Um, I'm glad that you are here this morning. It's a good day to be out and about because it's not too cold and it's not too hot. Wow, flashbacks to Miss Congeniality. Um, it's not too cold and it's not too hot. It's just right. The leaves are changing. It's beautiful outside. And it's so friendly inside. So I'm glad that you're here. Um, I want to, uh, I guess, make an announcement just in case it falls off the list. Um, typically, on the fourth Sundays, um, in the evening after 
services, we have a, a youth Devo, we get together, we eat some food, we have a lesson, and we have some fun. Because I don't want you to begin to anticipate things and think that you figured out my pattern, we changed it. It's not going to be on the fourth Sunday this month. It's going to be on the first Sunday next month. We had to push it back a week. Um, it worked better with our schedule. We're going to go out to Marion and Gina's, and we're going to have a good time out there, hopefully around a fire. Um, if it's cold, if it's hot, maybe not, but I hope it's cold because um, it's November. It should be, except for in Arkansas. Um, so we've got that going on, um, but I, I don't know. There, there's a lot of things to say, but I, I want to say thank you because this has been a crazy time for everybody. And with all of the, the, just the craziness that's going on in our world, it is every bit as crazy for the leadership of, of our church. And, and those that are involved in making decisions, whether it be on, on my end about youth things, or on the elders' ends, or on Mike's end, or anywhere else, it's, it's been hard. And it's been hard to know what the right decision is. It's been hard to know what the right thing to do is. But I want to just thank you for your patience. None of us have really learned how to do this. None of us went to school for this. Even if we went to school for ministry, we didn't talk about this. So I just thank you for that, for being patient with us. Because, I mean, ultimately, regardless of the, the situation, regardless of what's going on in our world around us, we're, we're called to be Christians. We're called to live as examples for Christ. We're called to make disciples for Christ, whether the world is normal, as normal as the world ever is, or when the world is in pandemic mode and everybody is, you know, absolutely freaked out. So I hope that that can serve as a good reminder for you. We're called to be Christians regardless of what's going on around us. But let's get back to our lesson. So Jesus called these four fishermen to uh, be fishers of men. He called them away from what they were used to, to something that was greater. And that call wasn't just for those fishermen. It wasn't just for the people that walked alongside Jesus as he traveled through the Middle East. It's a call that, well, has echoed to untold millions over the centuries. It's a call that we receive today. And we all have a choice to make. Are we going to follow Jesus? You know, it can be tempting in the middle of all the chaos that's going on, in the middle of all the, the distractedness and, and everything that's trying to pull our focus away to, you know, kind of set this call aside. We've got so many other things to do. We've got so many other things to worry about. We'll get back to Jesus when things settle down. Or we'll get back to church when things are a little less crazy. Or we'll get back to doing this discipleship thing when... Well, when we can be around people without having to wear a mask. But we can't let that happen. We, we can't do that. It doesn't work that way. The, the very nature of the claims that Jesus made and the invitation that he offered requires and really demands our full attention. It's not something that we can kind of put on the back burner. It's not something that we can just dismiss for the time being. Jesus said, I am the way to the Father. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Later in life, Jesus told Peter... Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which they must be saved. You see, Jesus didn't claim to just be one, one option, one, one choice on this buffet line in spirituality. Something where we can, we can pick and choose the parts that we want and then set aside the parts that we don't. Like the pickled okra, nobody likes pickled okra on a salad bar, except for my wife and a few other people. It's slimy, it's nasty, the texture's all wrong. 
Jesus isn't pickled okra. You can't leave him off if you don't want. Like, no, this is a requirement. If Jesus' claims are true, then his call demands our everything. Whether we're comfortable with it or not. And we really have no other choice before us but to drop everything and follow him. See, I, I want to take a look over, over a few lessons because there's more to digest in this than, than what you can in, in one sitting. But I want to look at the call that Jesus issues to all of us. You know, what, what is the call? And what, what does it cost to answer the call? What, what is this life where we're living worthy of this calling actually look like? But to begin, I want to, well, I want to clarify the call that we're talking about. You know, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to answer that call? See, Jesus calls all of us to follow him. You know, in the context of that original discussion, Jesus called to those fishermen, come and follow me. It was, it was almost a, a physical sense because they, they dropped their nets and they physically walked behind him. They followed him. They went where he went. And after his death and after his resurrection, they, they followed him by imitating his way of life. They followed after him by making more people disciples of him. Because that's what Jesus initially did. He, he went about teaching about God and he made disciples. He, he made students. He made people that would follow him. And then the people that were following him followed him by making more people to follow him. Does that make sense? Get your mind around that. But that's what it is. So for us to be followers of Jesus, what does that mean? First of all, it means dealing with this fundamental problem that we have. See, we have a problem between us and God, there's this, this barrier that's there. See, I, I heard recently in, in a, a sermon I was listening to online, the, the preacher said something that was so simple and yet so profound that I want to restate it. I want to say it again. Because what he said was, essentially, throughout all of Scripture, there is one theme echoed in different ways. And the theme, he said, was homesickness. I was like, man, that's kind of weird. But as he started to, to explain it and expand on what he meant, it, it began to make sense. We're in a place where we don't belong. I mean, all of us, probably, have been away from home at some point in time. And no matter how much fun we had whether we were in Mississippi catching fish or whether we were in Colorado hunting elk or whether we were in just wherever you are, no matter how good it is, it's just, it's not quite like home. And as I get older, this is kind of sad, but as I get older, the thing that I look forward to the most when going home is going back to my bed. I have a Robert-shaped indention in my bed that's where I belong, and if I'm not in that little dent, then I'm not comfortable. There's a place where we belong and we long for it. And, and what this, this preacher that's smarter than me said was, the entirety of Scripture can be summed up by humanity who is homesick. And that's so true. We long to get back to that place where we belong. We know that this world isn't our home. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't fit right. And we're longing to get back to that. So, to begin to follow Jesus, we have to recognize that we're not where we belong. That we, we have somewhere that we need to get back to and we have to deal with that problem. So we have to put God in the position that He belongs in. We have to understand that there's, there's something wrong and we have to seek to make it right. 
We have to set God above all else. And we have to continually struggle as we go through our days by prioritizing everything else under Him. See, we struggle with sin. And, and that's kind of the issue because sin essentially is putting other things above God. We have, to, we have to get things right in our minds and in our hearts. We have to put God at the top. Because sin separates us from God. And as you read through the Bible, you keep seeing this idea of sin and a punishment that's required because of that sin. We have to set the scales right. If you look through the Old Testament, you see stories like Lot and his wife, as they were escaping the destruction that was behind them, God told them not to turn back, and Lot's wife turned back. And then she was turned into a pillar of salt. Or God commands the Israelites not to work on the Sabbath, and then somebody picks up sticks and he is put to death because of gathering firewood. Or Achan and his family are put to death because they kept plunder that they were told not to. And there, there are all these examples throughout Scripture that we read. And a lot of people in our world today read those examples and they walk away kind of confused. Because after all, I mean, the Bible says that God is a God of love. That's what Christians preach. So why would a God of love do that? To them, these punishments seem harsh. Turn into salt for turning around, stone for picking up sticks. All of these things, they seem a bit extreme. And while those questions and those thoughts are honest, they show the, the fundamental problem with our perspective. We naturally view sin through our own human-centered cultural lenses. We can't imagine responding this way if those offenses were against us. If we told somebody not to do something and we did it, then they deserve to die. That doesn't make sense. But we have to understand that the penalty for sin isn't determined by our measure of it. Instead, the penalty for sin is determined by the magnitude of the one that we sin against. The penalty of sin is determined by the magnitude of the one that we sin against. Think about it. If you sin against a piece of wood, if you stub your toe on a block of wood and then proceed to throw the piece of wood across the yard, you've sinned against the wood. Not a big deal. But if you sin against an infinitely holy and eternal God, the one that created everything, then you are infinitely worthy of eternal punishment. See, there's, there's a difference. In one book that I read a while back, there, there was a, an example, and I thought this was so good. Uh, the author talked about his uh, friend who, who was uh, in the Middle East, and his name was Azim. And on, on one trip back to his home country, he, he served there as a, a missionary. And, and while he was in his home country, he was talking with a taxi driver about sin and its punishment. And, and as the conversation went, he was trying to explain the Christian view of sin and, and the problem that it causes. And, and the, the driver believed that because of his sin, he would pay for that sin for, for a little while in hell. And then he would ultimately go to heaven afterwards. I mean, he hadn't done very many bad things. He thought it would be a short time and then he would go to heaven. It'd be okay. 
So then being, being from this country, understanding the mindset, Azim says to the taxi driver, he said, what would you do if I slapped you? First of all, don't try that because it might not work real well. The driver says, I'll throw you out of the cab. He says, it, what if I went to a random guy up on the street and I slapped him in the face? What would he do to me? Well, the cab driver responds, I, I guess he would probably call some of his friends and they'd come beat you up. Okay. What would happen if I slapped a policeman in the face, Azim says? You'd be beat up for sure, and then you'd be thrown in jail. He says, okay, so, so what if I was to slap the king, the king of the country? What would happen if I were to slap him? And the driver looked at him, he says, and, and he laughed. He says, then you would die. Just like the taxi driver, we tend to underestimate the seriousness of sinning against God. We don't understand that our sin is against God. So we struggle with keeping God first. We struggle with sin. And it causes problems. In Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, Paul describes the Christians there as being dead in their sin. They were dead in their sin before those sins were washed away. And, and, and we were too. We all were, or are, depending on our relationship with Christ, dead in our sins. So sin is our problem, and we are dead in our sins without Christ. So how do we fix it? How do we help ourselves out of that situation? How, how can we even ask for help? Let me put it this way. How can someone who is dead ask for someone else to give him life? I mean, when, when a guy is dead, falls over dead, heart stops beating, flatlined everything, he's done. Does he then go, hey, guys, come on, CPR, get me back? No, he's, he's dead, it's done. Those, those things are impossible after you're dead. See, in your death, you need someone else, completely outside of yourself, to give you life. And that's exactly what Jesus has done. See, Jesus came to live the life that we couldn't live, a life without sin. And to die the death that we, those who have committed sin, deserve to die. Remember, the, the, the sin separates us from God. This sin against God deserves punishment. We deserve to die. And that's why Jesus came. He came to well, he came to make things right. He came to endure this wrath that we have earned so that we don't have to. Scripture shows us over and over again, Old Testament and New, that we're all sinners. Isaiah says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Romans says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We see that God is holy. God is just. And, and because of that, we deserve 
punishment. We deserve death. But yet in Scripture, we see over and over again that God is merciful. And He has this powerful love towards His creation. So then how can, how can God both be ultimately holy and those that sin against Him deserve this ultimate punishment and yet at the same time God is full of powerful love? How do those two things exist? How does it work? And the answer is the cross. On the cross, we see that gulf bridged. We see those two things that are opposites married together. On the cross, we see both love and hate. Jesus came to take our place. Jesus came so that we could follow Him back to the Father. And the Scriptures speak of Jesus coming, and they say that He will save people from their sins. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, remember this was his cousin, he knew who Jesus was. He knew what Jesus was. He called out to those that were around him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This imagery of God washing away the sin of the world is all throughout Scripture. We see it in the flood, God washing away the sins of the people. We see over and over again. David prays, wash away all of my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. And these these things in the Old Testament that we see are pointing forward to this ultimate forgiveness that comes through Christ in the New Testament. Paul wrote to the the Corinthian church, a church that was surrounded by a world full of sin. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So this kind of cleansing, is it's, it's a gift from God. It's not something that we can earn. It's not something that no matter how hard we try, we can't do it ourselves. We need somebody outside ourselves to do it for us. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, down in verse 4. The text says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The message of the Bible is that there is nothing that we can do to make our hearts clean before such a holy God. We can work constantly. We can pray without ceasing. We can give sacrificially. But in the end, our hearts are still going to be stained By sin. The only way to live a pure life before God is through Christ. Here's a quote for you. Faith is the realization that God's pleasure in you will never be based upon your performance for Him. Instead, God's pleasure in you will always be based upon Christ's performance 
for you. Let me say that again. Faith is the realization that God's pleasure in you will never be based upon your performance for Him. Instead, God's pleasure in you will always be based upon Christ's performance for you. If we truly understood that, it would change the way we look at God. So there's only one one way to God. There's only one way to heaven. And only one way to eternal life. So if there's only one way, what is it? How do we do it? How do we follow a guy whose feet haven't touched dirt in over 2,000 years? Look at the text. What did Jesus tell the people to do? What did His disciples tell people to do? The first step, once you know the truth, once you understand what's going on, is to repent. Jesus said it before He was crucified. John the Baptist said it before He was beheaded. Paul said it after Jesus went back to heaven. To repent means to to make a change, to change directions. You know, when you're you're marching, whether you're in the military or whether you're in band, sometimes the two are too close together, depending on the band director. But when when you're marching one direction and you do an about face, you turn and you march the other direction. It's going towards something and you turn and you go towards something else. So in in this case, we're walking with the world. We're walking towards the world. And by doing so, inherently, we're walking away from God. But when we repent, when we do this about face, we turn our back to the world now. We're walking to God, and we're walking away from the world. It's a transition. It's a change that takes place. So if we're going to follow Christ, if we're going to follow God, then that change means that we start walking towards Him. We stop walking towards the world. In in every conversion story that we read in the New Testament, we see these steps on that person's journey. As they're walking towards Christ, we see what happens. We see this imagery of sins being washed away repeated over and over and over again. We see baptism. And and to... Jesus' original audience, to the disciples' original audience, to to these Jewish people, they knew what baptism was. It wasn't a foreign concept. It wasn't something different. It was something that they had already been doing. See, the Jewish people had to be baptized ceremonially. They would go into the waters. You can go over to Jerusalem and see them. There's still stone basins all over the place over there around the temple. But you would go into these ceremonial waters. You would be washed... Therefore, you were clean, and you could go into the temple. You could be washed to go into the presence of God in their minds. So Jesus takes that example, and He takes it one step further. Baptism is now having your sins washed away forever. It's not just a, to become ceremonially clean so that you could be, take part in this religious practice. It's becoming spiritually clean between you and God. Baptism is, is powerful. But it, it's not a work that saves us, and this is where some people get tripped up. Out of all that we do to start following God, out of all that we do to answer that call, 
It's the only action that isn't something that we do for ourselves. Have you ever thought about that? A lot of people in the world say, well, baptism is just a work and, and works don't save us, so baptism isn't essential. The reality is baptism is the only thing that we don't do. Someone else baptizes us. Someone else lowers us into the water. Someone else raises us out of the water. Baptism is passive on our part. See, the message of the Bible is that God wants a relationship with you. And He's willing to do anything to get it. So the question that, that we all have to answer is, once we understand that there's, there's a call that's going out, when your phone rings, you have a choice. You can answer it, or you can ignore it. It's so awesome. Cell phones are great, because when the call comes in, and you don't want to answer it, you don't have to sit there and listen to it ring, and ring, and ring, and ring. Those of you who are older understand this. Those of you who are younger, back when phones had cords, when someone called and you didn't want to answer it, you had two choices. You had to pick it up and hang it up. That means the person that was calling you knew that you didn't want to talk to them. Or you had to sit there and listen to it ring, which got kind of annoying because if you didn't have an answering machine, we were poor, I didn't have an answering machine, it would ring and ring and ring till the person on the other end got tired enough that they would hang up or after it seemed like 20 rings or so, it would play a little message, the person isn't available or something. In our day and time, all we have to do is just push a button. Push a button on your cell phone and it'll quit ringing. The call goes out to us. Are you going to answer it or are you going to ignore it? See, God calls us into a relationship with Him. We set time aside every time we get together to offer an opportunity for you to process that, to think about your relationship with God, to, to have time to think about it. And, and if it's not right and it's something that you can address, then there's time set aside just for that. You talk to God while we're singing. It's right there. But if you need help, if it's something that, that you need someone else to help you with, then there's a time for that too because then you can let us know so that we can help. So what I want you to think about while we sing this song to in, encourage us, think about your relationship with God. Is it right or is there something else in the way? Because despite everything else that's going on in our world, the most important thing is putting God where He belongs, on the throne of our hearts. This morning, if there's something between you and God, if, you're, if your life isn't right, if God isn't on the throne, then I hope you can make Him that way while we stand and while we sing.
Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you and we thank you for the blessings that we have. God, we thank you for this congregation. We pray that our fellowship and love for one another shines in this community. We pray that as we struggle to get back to a normal in our lives, that that you will be with us as we make those decisions. God, we pray for our country at this time. We, we just ask that you would lead us in making wise decisions, godly decisions, out of love and, and a concern for one another. We just pray that we do what's right. We know that you will bless a nation that blesses you. God, we thank you for our preachers, that they have the ability to, to send forth the word in a way that we can use it in our everyday lives. We just pray for each and every one here, and it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.